The idea that a great cataclysmic event was upon us very roughly some 12,000 years ago, it's not a new one, it has been around in the mainstream science for many decades. But in very recent years it is becoming popular thanks to the alternative historians, amongst whom it has become extremely fashionable to assume that the ancient advanced civilization or even civilizations that existed on Earth and left uh, countless artifacts that we cannot even replicate nowadays was almost completely destroyed by that catastrophe that supposedly happened 12,000 years ago. This is in a very short the version presented to us by the thick volumes of um, academic works. They are assuring us that there was a long ice age which ended approximately this many years ago, approximately 12,000 years ago. And before that, basically, they are telling us that the ice caps were much, much bigger than now. This map is a typical example of how such information is uh, distributed all around as uh, scientific and it uh, bears a very scientifically sounding name, map generated by the National Geographical Data Center. It really looks like somebody has been collecting real data to reach all these conclusions about the catastrophe 12,000 years ago. And to understand everything better, let's talk with a real insider. Alexander Kaltepin graduated with honors from the Moscow Geological Prospecting Institute and completed postgraduate geological courses at the Institute of Oceanology at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Currently, he works for the most prestigious uh, research institutes in Russia and has uh, taken part in countless geological expeditions all over the globe. So lately, as part of his professional pursuits, he has been looking exactly into the details of the very research on the basis of which we are being told that it is established by numerous scientists that there was such a nice age and when did it end. He delved into numerous scientific reports signed by literally hundreds of his colleagues, all of them with impressive titles, of course, stating and confirming the existence of this ice age. So the reports are there, but the actual problem started when he tried to find even a single map that had an actual data reflecting, for example, the temperatures at that time or the results of uh, tests that uh, were performed during numerous drills in these um, regions supposedly covered with the glaciers at that time, there wasn't a single map of that sort. All the reports had a map and it was the same map copied everywhere, but this map was reflecting a concept. It wasn't an actual data map. None of the reports that submitted this map gave any clue as of the origin of its appearance, who introduced this concept, this map. So, as Kaltepin noticed that actually this map has no scientific value at all, as it only depicts a hypothesis with a known origin, next he delved into the actual details of the findings, because for all these scientists, hundreds of them, to put their signature, they have been allotted grants to conduct researches, so they must have been doing something out there in the fields, actually. So he opened their very records of the field research. And that was actually totally amazing. While drilling the ice in the earth in the northern region, they have been finding warm-loving species of plants. To put it in simple to understand words, trees that now grow in the southern parts of Russia were, in those bygone periods, growing in the northern parts of Russia. It was that warm. If you are interested in the exact uh, species and the regions where they were found, you can uh, visit the um, Russian video where the actual interview is published again on my channel. It is quite long. Here I am presenting only synopsis of it in English, not an actual word-by-word -word translation. 
And then Kaltepin continued about the mammoths. They are depicted in the official history books as uh, some sort of animals that lived in uh, cold conditions and we are told that they had a thick fur and a layer of fat to protect themselves from the cold. But from the actual field data, Kaltepin concluded something absolutely different. They lived in warmer climates and they had this uh, layer of fat also to protect them from the heat actually, very much like the elephants. They also have a protective tissue layer. Also, many animals that are perfectly adapted for equatorial and sub-equatorial ecosystems have actually fur and that is not there to keep them warm, just on the contrary, it helps them cool off in a certain way. And the same was the situation with the mammoths. They had their fur and special tissue layers to help them maintain optimal temperature in the warm conditions, not because they lived on glaciers. So, in other words, the data in the actual field reports, everything was quite clear. The only problem is that the map and the conclusions presented as an outcome and conclusion of this research did not correspond to the actual data. And yes, there was some sort of a cataclysmic event, but it did not end the Ice Age. It put the marker of its beginning. And then looking at the actual field data, Kaltepin also noticed that um, it could have been during this cataclysmic event that um, the pole relocated from Greenland to its current position. And so at that time, the temperature zones did not only change horizontally, so to say, but also uh, they tilted sideways. Now let's look at the full thing from another angle. How do we even know that all this happened 12,000 years ago? After all, the official science doesn't uh, have even reliable dating method for more recent events. If they can't do even that much, then how can we believe them that something happened thousands of years ago and how many thousands years ago exactly. To get a better grasp of this, please watch my video on carbon dating and dendrochronology and all these types of um, historic dating where I show that although these are absolutely valid scientific methods, their accuracy is exaggerated many fold when uh, they are presented to the layman, that means us, the ordinary people, they are presented uh, in a completely misleading and wrong light as some sort of um, absolutely reliable dating methods. And on the top of that, the tests are usually almost never performed under proper scientific conditions, which is a very major problem. Everybody has seen this type of very neat looking charts and everything here is figured absolutely. Who lived when? No doubt. Although I greatly admire their great confidence with which they are telling us such things, I wonder what about the grounds of such claims. And since yesterday I got hold of one of these real academics, I caught him alive. This was really the first question I asked him. Alexander Kotepin replied that the idea of the geological periods of the Earth existed since centuries, but they were viewed as relative only. Relative simply means that it was unknown which one occurred after which other, but it was not known how many years ago did that happen. To establish which one happened first is very easy. They are found in the lower earth layers, while the younger ones have their imprints in the upper layers of the earth. But somewhere towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, the absolute geological timescale started to be considered as scientific, 
which simply means those very same periods got their dates fixed. And the academics started accepting this and that period happened this many millions or thousands of years ago. Then he continued assuring me that this uh, didn't happen just like that by chance, but was uh, based on extensive drilling, especially done on the ocean floors. Basically, a whole lot of this uh, drilling was done all over the world and he told me in greater detail what kind of thick fat volumes were filled with that data and I'm telling you, I barely survived it. The volumes were so heavy hitting me on the head, it was like half an hour answer. I barely remained alive because when somebody with the impressive titles fires such heavy volumes, couple of kilos each, the, the fire is uh, so intensive that it almost overwhelmed me. Basically, the way they process this drilling data is they see, oh, there is a layer here that is, uh, let's say, half a kilometer thick. And then they calculate it is uh, this and this uh, many millimeters. It's usually a few millimeters per thousand years. So the period must have been this long because um, the sediments form rocks on the ocean bottoms with uh, such speed, few millimeters per thousand years. And then I asked him again, how did these people know at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th that it is exactly this and that many millimeters of rock being formed per thousand years? Did they start measuring it 1,000 years ago? Actually, for detecting the averages of such really minute amounts, like a couple of uh, millimeters per thousand years, you need a couple of thousand years of um, properly recorded scientific observations, minimum, to claim that this is scientific data. Did they do it even for 100 years? The answer to this question was that uh, this would uh, need additional inquiries and also he said it is not done the dating only on the basis of the formation of sedimentary rocks in the ocean but also they measure some sort of electromagnetic factors to see what kind of time period has lapsed since the magnetic pole shift. Although I myself don't understand how this can have any bearing on the results, since we don't know when the last pole shift occurred anyway. That is actually the unknown parameter in the equation. If the time that elapsed from an imaginary time of the pole shift is taken as true, then all the results that are based on this will be also imaginary. Actually, I'm not even gonna comment on this answer. I will let you make your own conclusions. How much are you gonna believe all these dates here? And to return to our original question, it all started with the date of 12,000 years ago when the catastrophe occurred. That is based on the dating of these geological charts like this. And I really, really hope that all of you, my listeners, will understand the serious implications and sequences of all these discrepancies. And just to avoid misunderstanding, the very fact that, that the mainstream geology dating is highly questionable does not by itself mean that any other alternative theory is correct. Some people tend to think that if the mainstream dating is wrong, then the creationist geotheory of the young earth must be correct. Please be very careful with this type of theories and just to remind you that the same party that sponsored, so to say, those fraudulent maps of the Ice Age and made them look like something scientific, the very same party sponsored in historic time the editing and re-editing and re-editing of the Bible. So if you are reading the Gospels, please be aware that a lot of sponsored things are inserted inside things that were not written by the actual followers of Jesus. And another point that Alexander Kultipin touched in his answer was the actual reason for which uh, literally hundreds of uh, respectable academics would put their signature below uh, an Ice Age map 
which is basically just an idea and it's not based on actual data. He said that the people who signed it are very much like uh, his colleagues that he meets on a daily basis. These are uh, definitely not stupid people. They even enjoy their work. They like observing various things under microscopes, going on expeditions and reading for many hours in line. So they certainly understand the vast difference between a map based on data and a map based on somebody's speculation. Nor are they any type of evil people who enjoy misleading others. This is really not the case. The only reason for which they had to put their signatures below these types of map is because otherwise their full institute would not receive subsidies or maybe even get closed down. They would be exiled from the scientific community. They would never get a scientific job. Considerations of this type. So that happened a century ago when this Ice Age thing was decided. And because of their respected signatures, the scientists nowadays, they don't know that it was a sponsored Think. Nobody told them that and they take it for a pure coin and continue building the rest of uh, their uh, scientific work on a wrong basis without being even aware of it. Another question that I discussed with uh, Kaltepin was uh, the problem with erosion. For more details on the actual problem you can uh, see my video on the Khmer megaliths. The problem is that uh, since the time of photography, people compare photos uh, taken years ago and what we see now and they realize that actually stones and uh, historic things erode very, very fast. Like for example, this lovely Shiva was uh, carved just a couple of decades ago by uh, an Italian hippie maybe 20 years ago, something like that. And these are the older photographs. And this is already a recent one. Part of the nose is missing. Heavy erosion here. It's happening actually very, very fast. Another example you can see in my video about the megaliths of uh, Mount Karatak. Over there, there is an inscription what was it, 70 years old or something like this? And at places it's uh, fully eroded, cannot be read anymore. So what's going on here? If uh, the erosion is so fast, then a lot of the historic stuff wouldn't be that old, as we are told. The mainstream historians are trying to put together all kinds of clumsy explanations, blaming it, for example, to dirty, polluted air. Which is uh, not extremely convincing uh, because uh, the erosion seems to be very fast both in uh, absolutely polluted cities and in places with uh, relatively clean air. And it's not uh, just the exposed stone, other factors as well. For example, plants uh, growing through ruins and destroying them with their roots. This is happening with amazing speed nowadays. So what, in the past, when the ruins were abandoned and nobody was taking care of them, the trees were not growing? And there are many examples like this. In reply, Alexander Kultipin uh, told me that uh, he has not only read many such uh, cases, but also during his uh, numerous expeditions, various people have been complaining in person, observing in real life that uh, monuments in stone erode rather fast. Then Kaltepin explained that um, the subject of the rate of erosion is not well studied because it's actually extremely complicated. It depends, uh, it varies a lot due to the different conditions. But even he agreed that uh, general guidelines, that's how he called them, are given in uh, certain scientific publications. And he even added more to my doubts by saying that he has uh, seen uh, rocks, proper natural rocks, that are supposedly extremely old, but they look uh, absolutely new compared to some historic buildings in the same conditions. Theoretically, those rocks should be very ancient and exposed for ages to the elements, but uh, the buildings that we are told are 
made one or two thousand years ago appear much much older than them so basically he also notices very suspicious things my personal position regarding this problem remains the same. I really think that many, many of the historic uh, stone buildings are much younger than we are told. And the alternative researchers, uh, many of them, tend to try by any means to date them to some absolutely ancient times, even 12,000 years ago, just to prove that uh, there is something left from the old advanced civilization. But there is no need to do that. Michael Cremo has compiled long ago his fantastic work and he has already proven that the old advanced civilization has left many things for us. They are there, well documented in his books. We don't need to artificially put more things back in time. And another reason for which very recent buildings are sent back in time by alternative researchers for no reason is um, that uh, they want to create some more reasonable picture uh, without facing the discomfort of realizing that all of the recent history is also fantasy because this is a very difficult psychological moment to face that you have been living for so many years with the lies about where did you come from I have proved in the Survivor series that even the recent history is largely a fantasy, but many people experience psychological difficulties to accept all this, usually just partially. But judging from the hundreds of emails that I received, in 99% of the cases, when somebody doesn't agree, this is the only reason. So, most alternative history researchers face this problem to some extent or another. And uh, because these uh, uh, remarkable megaliths like the Peruvian one or the ones in Turkey simply don't uh, fit in the fantasy recent history, then the only possibility they see is that, oh, they must be very old. But this is usually not the case. Just look at them, at these uh, sharp, very well-preserved angles. It is highly unlikely that these uh, well-preserved edges are many thousands of years old, based on the actual observations of the people about the rate of erosion, not based on the fantasy academic rates of erosion. So this has not been buried in the ground, this has been exposed to the elements and appears to be very freshly cast. I don't imply in any way that there is no really old stuff in Peru. Just on the contrary, uh, we've seen some seriously eroded stones, for example, in Pumapunku, while others over there at the same location are extremely well preserved. It's not clear were, were the well preserved buried in the ground or. Um, Maybe was it a few cultures, one of the top of uh, the other, using the same site for a very extended period of time? All this needs to be actually properly researched without any prejudice, instead of uh, being uh, guided by some sort of uh, fashion to always say, oh, everything is 12,000 years old. And we do have some extremely old things, like, uh, for example, during uh, mining, a cement wall was uh, reached by the miners very deep in layers of coal that should be many millions of years old. So we do have, in a very rare cases, um, some remains of extremely ancient ruins although most of them would be devastated by time or other reasons. I personally remain highly skeptical about the full dating, mainstream dating of the geological periods of the Earth, and um, it's not just one suspicious thing. Also, in the survivors I mentioned the streets of Venice. They were proper streets, as shown on the photographs and the video in that uh, episode of the survivors. But now they are uh, actually canals for boats. 
a couple of meters below sea level. Well, they were streets when the houses in Venice were built. It's uh, visible in the video. They are part of the city, the old town, which is not an ancient town by any means. People still live in those houses. But according to official geological dates, the sea level should have been much higher when Venice was built. So after trying for half an hour to undermine the authority behind this number of 12,000 years as a supposed time for this uh, big catastrophe, let me try to say something positive about it. In uh, various sources it is uh, quoted that a similar date, 11 and a half thousand years ago, is mentioned in the book of Veles as indeed a time of um, planetary scale catastrophe. This book seems to have some authority, but unfortunately neither me nor Alexander Kultipin has studied it, but I intend to do it and will keep you updated. And now let's get back to the original question. Was an ancient advanced civilization destroyed by a planetary scale cataclysmic event some 12,000 years ago? Certainly, if there was a such an event at that time, it would have damaged the civilization residing on Earth at that time. But who can tell us which cataclysm happened when? Do we have a proper geological timeline? Personally, to me, I see it only as a very trendy fashion amongst alternative history researchers to connect any possible cataclysmic event with 12,000 years ago while at the same time giving zero importance to large devastations like uh, the devastated uh, forest of Siberia some 200 years ago and all these uh, buildings in new classical style buried under a few meters of clay again a few hundred years ago. I strongly feel that the importance of the date of 12,000 years ago is extremely exaggerated. It has become almost equivalent to the Great Flood, although after critical examination it seems that there have been many, many Great Floods in history, some of them local, some of them could be even global, and yet every single flood myth nowadays tends to be related for a known reason to this date of 12,000 years ago. Basically, we don't know, was there a great cataclysmic event at that time and to what extent did it damage the infrastructure and technology, but what I can tell you for sure is that it did not reduce an advanced society to the stage of savages fighting for survival on a daily basis. And the proof of that is not only that people were building amazing megaliths even some 200 years ago, as in the case of St. Petersburg, but mostly because the most essential part of the knowledge actually never got lost. And it is even nowadays the shamans, the eternal keepers of the knowledge, continue singing it while sitting beside the fire in the evening with their drum. And these are not only shamans in the tribes that are still uncontacted by our so-called civilization or in the tribes that live on the fringe of this civilization. Many highly evolved souls with developed astral vision even while living in the same body like me and you are walking amongst us. Unfortunately, usually we can't even recognize them to benefit from their wisdom, our vision being clouded. From the liana, the fire, the leaves and the water, she has come to heal, dressed in flowers and the magic of colors. Clouded because we consider it more important to listen for hours to politicians of non-existing morals or with pinpointed attention, follow an empty ball for many hours. Those should be certainly more important than inquiring into the nature of our own immortal soul or its origin. It is not because of some sort of bad luck that we live in times of total historic blackout. We brought this blackout upon us ourselves by deviating from the true path of sitting by the fire and listening to the genuine shamans. Instead of that, we respect and listen to people with expensive suits. But since many of us have decided to awaken to our multidimensional nature the way our forefathers were, 
That is why the true history starts transpiring. I can't tell you exactly when is it gonna reveal itself completely, but I can tell you exactly how it will happen. It will happen the way we attempted to do it in the interview with Peter Petrov. And since the number of people who are accessing the astral plane is growing very rapidly nowadays, many of them will be coming back with historic data. Real historic data, not just hypotheses and false maps like those of the quackademics, but actual eyewitness accounts of entities who witnessed the events. The stories told by those people will be of course colored by their personal understanding of the given historic situation. For example, if they were involved in some sort of a conflict, like for example a war, it is very likely that they will be convinced that the opposite party is, uh, let's say, unlawful invader. And the so-called innovator will think the same about the other person who considers himself innocent. But after removing this uh, personalized coloring of the event, so to say, still, the fact of the war can be extracted from such accounts. And I'm not talking about some sort of fantasy stories that cannot be confirmed. Countless cases have already been confirmed by absolutely tangible data and the general historical picture that these people paint is much closer to the artifacts and ruins that we have at hand. It corresponds to them much better than the mainstream history. So even if we take all the accounts as they are with the personal coloring together still, it will be much more truthful than all the history textbooks, the supposedly scientific ones you have seen. And as far as more precise and interesting details, like the location of the cities of the Atlantis, the exact years when the events took place, all that will be revealed very easily once we collectively become aware how precious these historic accounts are and we start collecting them, verifying them, different independent sources start comparing and verifying them and then most importantly we need the social structure that will protect possible ruins and artifacts which belong to the ancient advanced civilizations because currently it is actually for our own good that uh, these places stay unexcavated in the ground because if we get hold of them, we'll simply ruin them as swines with our peace missions bombing historic sites all over the world. And sometimes we are much better than that. Then the artifacts only disappear mysteriously. So at least we are left with the hope that they are collected somewhere and maybe one day when we grow up we can collect our heritage, hopefully. Ayahuasca,